and welcome once more to the Wildlife Community Podcast, full of insight, tips and tales of wildlife-friendly gardening. And this week, according to Jamie Oliver, we are speaking to the Queen of Herbs. And that is the other thing about gardening. Remembering, you learn from the seasons and gardening will teach you patience and slow you down. And you will then have time to notice what is happening. That's the wonderful and incredibly welcoming Jekka McVicker speaking to me at her herb farm near Bristol, where I visited on a gloriously sunny day recently. And the sound of bees just filled the air. Um, Now, Jekka is an organic herb grower. She's famed for her passion and extensive knowledge of firstly growing and then cooking with herbs and designing sustainable herb gardens. She's won the RHS top accolade of Victoria Medal of Honour and she's a regular judge at RHS flower shows. Now, if you're listening to this podcast in the first week of its release, you could win two tickets to an open day at Jekka's Farm together with a signed copy of Jekka's Herb Cookbook. All you need to do is listen to Jekka telling us when is the right time to sow seeds outdoors. She has a bit of an embarrassing tale about how you can tell whether the soil is warm enough. Email your answer to hello at wildlifeworld.co.uk with the subject line podcast competition and we'll pop you in the draw to win. And here is Paul to help me introduce Jekka. But first, Paul, why why, why would we talk about herbs in a podcast about wildlife? Well, most of them have got flowers, haven't they? So flowers evolved in symbiosis with insects and pollinators emerged around about the same time. They're, they're in it together, basically. So you're, <laughs> you're always going to see something alighting on a, on a herb flower. But also, interestingly, uh, there's a lot of invertebrates in the UK, like the large blue caterpillar, a large blue butterfly caterpillar, for instance, that feeds on um, wild thyme. There's those kind of relationships, too, between not necessarily the flowers, but the, the herbs themselves. Um, we're not the only ones that like to eat herbs. Um, <laughs> nice yeah uh, yeah and some some of the some of them aren't classed as pests either so i think pretty much anybody who knows what a large blue butterfly is in the uk would be absolutely delighted to share some of their wild time with a large blue caterpillar and they're incredibly rare as well like there's only a handful of places in the uk you'll see one of those um, oh really yeah who's to say if we were all growing um wild thyme in our gardens and allowed a few meadow ants to to make ant hills <laughs> that there's a chance that they'd spread out of their current hot spots into into gardens <gasps> there's something for us all to do this weekend then <laughs> yeah it, uh, it may take a few decades are you a herb grower do you do you have herbs in the garden oh absolutely yeah in fact that's it was growing herbs that got me interested in gardening and which led to me becoming a wildlife gardener eventually. So okay. yeah, buying some some herbs from uh, a supermarket and thinking, oh, I wonder if I could get these to grow in the garden and putting them out at the right time. You know, thankfully, we've got the Internet and uh, knowledgeable people like Jekka to, to yeah. tell us when things are supposed to happen. But I, I'm pretty sure at the time I, I just stuck something in the ground and uh, crossed my fingers. And yeah, I became a herb herb quite quickly. Then I started to move on to sowing seeds. Yeah, and when, once you start cooking more and growing stuff that you use in your own cooking, that that just makes everything better. Yeah, I suppose it's a, a an introduction into gardening because you're using something that's very satisfying and you're actually benefiting from, and therefore yeah. Yeah. potentially and get more joy. It's expensive too. You know, you buy you buy herbs. That are already growing or even if they're they're cut and just for sticking in in the food preparation um, yeah. they're expensive and as well as being really aromatic and great in cooking they just smell awesome when they're growing as well what what do you actually grow what works well in your garden that you also find works for the bees that are visiting marjoram uh, thyme rosemary but there's all kinds of stuff like summer savory things that you might not let 
go to flower normally that have really attractive flowers for pollinators. There are loads of trees in blossom at the moment. I just recently learned that um, one of our trees, the beech tree, <laughs> although it doesn't put on a spectacular show of flowers, you can eat the leaves in, in salads, apparently. Beech tree leaves? Yeah. Yeah, the young, young trees. Uh, so the young leaves on the tree. So the first batch that emerge that are quite translucent. Yeah. yeah you can throw them in a salad, apparently. <laughs> oh, I love it. How is the wildlife garden going at the moment? Because this will be your first spring there. Are yeah. you seeing signs of nesting and hedgehogs coming out of hibernation? And I haven't seen any hedgehogs in person here yet. I've seen traces of them here. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't have anybody nesting or hibernating over the winter in our hedgehog house. But there's a chance that we might get a nest building exercise going on. But yeah, loads of birds loads of birds are nesting around so we've got so many nest boxes and so many mature trees mm. i'm delighted to say that i've seen a tree sparrows nesting yes yep so i'm really chuffed about that but also got long-tailed tit nests that i've seen oh, wow. blue tits and great tits and who knows what else we've got i mean i'm pretty sure we've got blackbirds nesting and collared doves and wood pigeons nesting too and jackdaws obviously and we get a lot of jackdaws here so I think they've got nests up there or at least they they hang out and have arguments up there they um, do they argue like bilio and they've they got do. these yeah. they've got these faces they crack me up because I just watch them like every morning as I go out to work walking around you know kind of carrying their nesting material and looking at each other like whatever <laughs> yeah yeah they've got that that kind of silverback sheen on them as well haven't they and, and a bit of silverback attitude kind yes. of strutting around yes very much so <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, I, I did observe something really interesting it wasn't a jackdaw uh, but a blackbird a male blackbird I've noticed I have suet pellets in like a peanut feeder but this blackbird male has noticed that it's open on the bottom so he flies <laughs> vertically up and kind of beats his wings a couple of times and pecks, pecks, and dislodges a couple of suet pellets, and then he drops back down and picks them up and then flies up again, pecks, pecks. Does it all day, every day. That's quite fascinating. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he deserves it for that kind of effort. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's head back to Herbs now and yes. um, head over to Bristol to hear from Jekka as she kindly takes me on a tour. We've come to your, do we call it a farm, Jekka? Well, it's interesting. It is a nursery because I produce plants from seed and cuttings right the way through to finished product. But for some reason, and I don't know when it started, herb nurseries are always called herb farms. But you're actually standing in my herb eaten. Now you've heard of the word arboretum. I have. We're based next door to Western Bird Arboretum. So there you are. So that's Arboretum. And then you have Pine Eatum, which is a collection okay. of pines. Arboretum is a collection of trees. So I was in this meeting and looking around the room and one gentleman had an Arboretum, another one had a Pine Eatum, another one had a Rose Eatum. And I thought, herb farmer, herb farm. Mm. What does Eatum mean? It shows how bored I was in the meeting. <laughs> And I looked up and I found out that Eaton means a collection of. So you are now standing in my Herb Eaton. I like it. I can understand why All you've right. done that. Yes. And I've divided the Herb Eaton up into plant families. Now, okay. I know that many people listening won't un understand the one word I've just said. But basically, you have cousins, uncles, aunts, mum and dad. And you will have a family trait. Blue eyes. Actually, I'm the odd one out. You're the odd one out. Well, there you go, <laughs> you see. And, and, and ears that sticky out or not sticky out, a nose, certain shape, chins, another characteristic. Mm -hmm. Plants are exactly the same. Okay. And there was this man called Liniers, and he looked at all the plants and decided how they looked and how they were, what family they were in. And we're standing next door to a rosemary in full flower at the moment. And if you look carefully at a rosemary, it, you can actually see the flower, the way it drops its, its lower petal. 
and that used to be called the lamiaci because it meant sticking your tongue out. I mean labiati. Now it's called lamiaci. And the lamiaci family to me is just magic because they are quintessentially all the herbs you know. And they've all have characteristics and flowers similar shape. So you've got rosemary, you've got lavender, you've got thyme, you've got oregano, oh, I see. you've got winter savory, you've got bergamot mm -hmm. um, and catnip, all that, all that family, absolutely, oh, and basil, you know, very similar. For example, when you're pruning them, you can only prune within the green. That means you can't prune back after when it's no green showing it won't reshoot off old wood. Oh, so you as a gardener need to treat this family of herbs in a similar, in yes. a similar way? Yes, and, and you'll find with families, you know, um, like in my family, we all have a passion for cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here, yeah, to be fair. <laughs> Did you see? So it, it is a family trait and, and, and plants are exactly the same. So with the Lamiaceae family, you can't prune lower. And you certainly know that with lavender, everyone knows that. You stay within the green, or you do with rosemary. And you can see these weren't pruned well enough, so we're now woody. But I quite enjoy that because you can see through. Um, but then I love the other ones which have been pruned and are dense. Yes. So, and then you get the herbaceous ones, which are mint. That's a herbaceous, herbaceous plant. It's a plant that dies back into the ground in winter, has a rest, and then pops back up again. Oh, and right? we probably panic thinking we've killed it. Yes. And <laughs> we haven't. So th that's the herbaceous lamiaces. And then you get the annual lamiaces, like some of the sa sages are annual and things like this. So, uh, and basil, of course, mm -hmm. which is a renowned annual. Um, but I find that basil is just, if you stop and smell the leaf of basil and then go and smell the leaf of, of, of mint and then mix that with a little bit of thyme, you realise how even their scents are interlinked. So this is the nutty world of being a herb farmer that is passionate about what they grow. And also I'm passionate about the history. So you're standing next door to a bay tree at the moment, which is in full flower. And interestingly, behind us are the rosemaries in full flower and it's covered in bees. The bay here is beautifully in flower and the pollinators are not bees. You're right. Yeah, the sound is all behind me and not in front of me now. <laughs> Isn't that it? But this, this plant is known as the bay and it is laurel. And it gives its name yeah. to baccalaureate, right. poet laureate. Yes. And in the Olympic Games, they were crowned in laurels. Of course. When they won. Yes. And uh, the oracle at Delphi, she used to eat six leaves of these before expanding and I remember saying that to one group and uh, I turned around they were young and they were all stripping the tree and having a chew I said seriously guys <laughs> you'll be sick first <laughs> I don't know how she did it but it is and but to cook with yeah prefer them in a stew <laughs> no I, do you know my favorite yeah I make the best bay ice cream you have ever ever eaten. I didn't expect you to say that. <laughs> Ice cream is gorgeous. Basically now you see the how I got into herbs was via my stomach because my mum had a herb garden and I could tell the difference between you know all the plants before I went to school and so I've been passionate about food and herbs because if you use herbs you make a very simple meal go a long way and back mm -hmm. to my ice cream Right, I'm a yellow label shopper, which means when anything's on offer. Ah, <laughs> you, know, you love a three for two. <laughs> no, no, I'm not a three for two. I'm when it's come up to the sell by date or a day off the sell by date, they lower the price by half. Ah, okay. It's called yellow labels. Yes. In this, in the store I go in. Anyway, so what you need is a yellow label custard. A yellow label custard, yeah. right? Preferably a posh one, which is made with vanilla. But <laughs> that's, that's so rare that it gets yellow labelled. Mm. But a custard. And then you put three leaves of bay into the custard as you bring it slowly to warm. Mm. Then you turn it off and let it stay uh, infusing for um, about 30 minutes. 
Take out the bay leaves, let it cool right down, put that in your ice cream maker. Oh, okay. And if you really want to be posh, you could add a couple of cardamom pods as you did it. Oh, very as nice. Well. Yes. So bay and cardamom ice cream. I love it. Um, can I turn you back around <laughs> one second? <laughs> to, look, to look at the, the, the yeah, bees to today to the are bees. amazing. They are... Uh, the, here at the moment, there's a honeybee on here at the moment. And she's being really busy. And there's a lovely, lovely um, bumbly down the bottom yes, there. Yes, I've seen the bumble. And uh, it's covered. And we're still relatively early in the season. Well, we're the beginning of April. Mm. And uh, if I take you up here, follow me. This is this rosemary back here has been in flower since November. And it's still being visited by the bees so this has been in flower since november so it's been a nectar plant right the way through winter now and we've had really cold winter as well we have excuse my naivety when it comes to gardening but i would assume that you would cut it back when it was in flower and therefore no. you reduce the chance of it being used by bees i suppose but you, you cut it back after flowering ah and that is for all the Lamiaceae family. You cut lavender back one eighth in the eighth month, which is after flowering of the Angustifolias. Right. right. Okay. And you always cut all the times back after flowering, mm -hmm. and it stops them getting woody. Ah, okay. So uh, the, the, the herbs have a chance to be there for the pollinators. Absolutely. First. Yeah, and and I'm a great believer. I, have you just the thought? Have you ever eaten? A rosemary flower. I have not. There you go. Wow. So why would I get rid of them? That's lovely. Isn't but that you, yeah, you wouldn't naturally think that that is what's supposed to go in my cooking. You would go for the... So this, right, just a mashed potato. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just before you serve, a sprinkling of beautiful blue rosemary flowers. Really? It's incredibly fragrant. It is, isn't it? And but I mean, it, but it's all of them, and any any plant. This is a general rule, but it is a pretty good safe one. If you want to know whether a flower is edible, the plant must be edible. I was quite horrified the other day to see someone serving daffodils on a on a cake, because daffodils are not edible. So to check and be safe, mm -hmm. because it's got a little out of hand. This edible flower, malarkey. <laughs> that, um, yeah, please make sure that the plant is edible as well. I, I think I'd be right in saying that herbs are not people's first thought when they think about building a, a garden for wildlife. Why Which is, is that a, wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it's totally bonkers. Yeah. Um, because if you come this way, in summer, we have here, because of all these herbs, dragonflies, we have butterflies like you've never seen. And I've got a mint up here. Oh, look at that bumbly. There, isn't that gorgeous? Oh, that's beautiful. We grow 24 different rosemaries. And when you see them together, you realize actually how different they are. Not just in habit, but in mm. color of leaf and color of flower. And then up here, we've got pink ones. And we've got white ones. That's lady in white up there. They look gorgeous together because they, Don't they almost appear like different plants. Yes. So, I mean, as a border mm. that flowers or a hedge. I mean, look, if, if you trim that, because you can see I've trimmed those. Mm -hmm. If you trim that and have that as a hedge at home, wouldn't that just be stunning? It would be beautiful. So that's bees, but the, the pollinator world is much bigger than just bees. So I'm very aware that the that you can get these minute flies that also pollinate and here growing just here you can see some mink coming through yes well this is actually now an escapee from here <laughs> what happened was silver mint over there married Bodleian mint over here and they've made jecker's mint in the middle there and this is Jekka's mint on the floor, which is slightly furry compared to Bugley. It does look furry. Yeah, and, but the flowers, the pollinators, I can't tell you. So you had, it was, you could actually see the whole structure. So you had the tiny, minute ones on the top, 
-hmm. and then it went bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you had the bees. So as the bees left, the flies came down. And when the flies left, these minute ones came down. So there was always a feast happening here on this Bodleian mint. And again, you should wait until the flowers have had their turn before yes. you cut it back. And, and, that, and that goes across the board. You know, mm. I, I'm always surprised when people take to being too tidy yes with their garden and um, sometimes also wood is good because then you get your beetles and your other things it, because it's not just pollinators everything is interlinked mm -hmm. um, and we uh, as a human race we are part of this chain so if you go and I've, I've always been organic here ever since I've been here. And uh, so we have greater crested newts and toads and frogs in the tunnel. Oh, that's fantastic. See, they all winter in there because it's beautifully damp. Yes. And it's warm. Warm, yeah. And, they, and they'll have safe places under the plants mm -hmm. to live. Now, so they will then eat the slugs and snails. Okay, and I used to pay the children in their pocket money was <laughs> to collect me ladybirds to put in the glass house. Because when the ladybirds lay their larvae, which doesn't look anything like um, uh, a ladybird, it's a little black thing with orange dots, they are, eat more green fly than ladybirds themselves. Wow. So everything is linked yes. and we're part of that link. So you destroy one part of it. So this is why I'm hugely against people using any of these nicotinocti Neocides sprays. Yes, yes. Yep. <laughs> Nicky Naughty. Definitely <laughs> Naughty. Um, so, yeah, I get very excited. Now, this, we're coming to a very interesting tree here. Small tree, and it's from northern China, and it's the Sichuan pepper. This um, is a Sichuan pepper tree. Yes. Just coming out. They are. They are. Xenotherium simulans. Now, what I find fascinating about this plant is it will go into flower in about May and for one day, one day only, mm -hmm. it's hum, and then they've gone. It one is poll day. pollinated in one day. Okay. Because the flowers disappear so quickly or? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> but, you know, because I'm so... Uh, much involved with my plants I notice that mm. um, but you can't help but notice because the noise uh, what I'm enjoying is the huge thorns which <laughs> almost <laughs> replicate the feeling of eating Sichuan pepper <laughs> but but it but what I think it looks more like a rhinoceros or something yes, prehistoric yes. Yeah, I mean it is pretty formidable so this one's from China then I've got a Japanese one around the corner what have you noticed as the, the farm has grown here about the wildlife that visits? Well I'm hugely lucky having always been organic and having always respected the soil and respected the fact that the soil is the engine of the garden. I've just noticed that we are have such a a huge diversity of birds, insects, uh, everything, worms, beetles. Mm. Mm. I mean, some of them, when they get out of balance in my glass house, I will use IPM, which is Integrated Pest Management. Well, I will introduce the Enkazi wasp to control the white fly. Okay. It's, and things like this. So, so it's much more than just you know I don't spray and if I do spray I will use a soft soap a horticultural soap uh, because that won't affect the bees in any way at all oh, okay yeah it's uh, you know, oh the old Victorians were very very clever and they were the ones who used to use this fatty acid soft soap and uh, so look this shows you this is borage in flower ladies and gentlemen and it is April and um, it is seriously, seriously odd because this is a big plant. It means it's got through the winter and very soon now the bees will find it. It's not as popular as blue, 
Have you noticed that bees and other pollinators go to blue, blue before any other colour? Blue and purple, yes. Yeah. Yes. Before, uh, but then here I've got um, uh, that big green one there. That is Ferula communis. That's the giant fennel, not the country fennel. And this coming into flower here, which will also be a hum. This is woad. Dye yourself blue. Not heard of that one. Woad. Woad. Hmm. woad. To hmm. dye, it's a natural dye plant. Okay. They used to use, they use it for wool and things to make it blue. Mm -hmm. But in, in Chinese medicine, it is used um, for meningitis. So I'm wondering now with the, this upsurge of meningitis, whether this is going to become really important. I mean, I find the whole thing, the interconnection. Now, oh, there's another one here, which is really popular with pollinators down here. This one here, you won't see in many gardens. This is the pomegranate. The pomegranate? Yeah, it's just coming back. Do you see? It's just about to break. I can. And that's been out all winter. That's going to be a stunning colour. Yeah, it is. The, in, the ones inside have broken. Um, but this plant here, this is the milk thistle, right? And the Latin of this is not that. It's <laughs> the Latin of this is silly bum. Silly bum? Yes. Isn't that I'm one? enjoying it. <laughs> yes. So you can understand when I'm teaching children and they say, well, why do you have to use the, the, the Latin names? I said, because when you're traveling, common names can really muddle up plants because you can have a plant called mint that isn't mint. So I've got a bed up there which is all called mint, but they're not actually mentha. They're not real mints, but they're called mint. So it's really important and especially when you want to eat abroad and you want to know what you're eating but yeah. this is called silly bum maritinum it is the milk thistle uh, and it is one of the most important herbs for your liver it almost looks like a brassica it's a thistle <laughs> oh, I see the top now yes yeah they're thistles and of course they get covered in pollen by bomb I mean the bees when that goes into flower heavenly what about if I want to start a small herbatum, can we say, in mm -hmm. my garden? What would you okay. recommend as the, the basics? Great, the great thing about herbs is they are naturally wild plants, mm -hmm. which is why the pollinators love them so much. Oh, right. Okay. They're open pollinated. Uh -huh. So therefore, it's like it's handed down in history through the, their DNA of how, how to benefit from them. Um, but, but because they're wild plants, they're invasive. So my top tip for anyone starting, you know, a small bed with herbs in is choose herbs you're going to use. Ah, so you're going to get some culinary or medicinal benefit from exactly, yourself, Exactly, your because family. then you'll start keeping the plant under control and stop mm. it invading your the rest of your space mm -hmm. because and this one here this is the Japanese Szechuan much smaller thorns <laughs> and only just coming into flower but equally pollinated in a day and equally looking a little bit like don't touch me exactly <laughs> keep away <laughs> but these three beds here which is four beds here which is why I want you to come here mm. the, these are all UK native herbs I've got primrose and cowslip yes well cowslip you see goes back an oxlip the cowslip was used uh, medicinally because the bells shake they used it with palsy it was a medicinal plant it's not so now mm -hmm. um, but again very good for, for pollinators um, some flies absolutely love it. Then there you've got wood sage, which is what we used to smoke before uh, tobacco came into this country. Uh, there you've got um, scabious uh, coming on, and this is this one here coming into flower. This is uh, sweet um, sweet woodruff, and here this one coming now, just showing, just breaking. This is Mia from Scotland and it's a member of the carrot family and that's skull cap so this is a totally uk native bed and then here you've got the wild garlic coming into flower oh yes good king henry yarrow tansy salibonet marshmallow and now the king of kings <laughs> this one going into flower just starting to run to flower now 
this will be eight foot when it finishes getting to right height. You can eight foot? Yes, you can see the swelling here. Yes. This is Angelica Archangelica. It looks a bit like a fennel type. Well done. <gasps> Excellent. Oh, God, it's never you. <laughs> yeah, same family. But it isn't. It isn't mm -hmm. fennel. It is uh, umbiliferous or APAC now. And it is um, a native UK herb that used to grow wild all along the River Thames. And it has huge green white flowers like this, globes. Oh, that smells of nectar. The bees adore it. But what's really interesting is you'll have the bees first and then the flies will come in for seconds. Uh, it's, really, it's, it's really, you take know, if, turn, eh? if, yeah, if, if you take your time to actually stand and watch it, and this is chicory here on the corner, and that's lovage over there, and that's sweet sicily, that also is very good for pollinators, and that'll be through later. But obviously Angelica for the small garden is not advised, because <laughs> it is a really big baby, and it's monocarpic, which means it doesn't die until it flowers. But if you like gin... Oh, it's really? one of the main ingredients in making your own gin. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, that's why that's, that, every country that has an alcoholic drink makes it from the, their native herb. And the native oh, herb running through London at the time of the gin, first gin was being made, was Angelica. And so hence, what hence do you make? The, yes. Yeah. So, so um, back to again, choosing plants. Mm. So I would choose a cross section of plants so that you've got flowers at different times um, so you've got the flowers and you've got the edibles all in one so really good ones for the small garden are things like thyme marjoram all those are excellent they won't invade they won't take over too much and they'll attract pollinators and, and the, some of the small lavenders are also very good see lavender when you're planting a garden okay as someone who's a novice okay most plants you would plant driving a car small car steering wheel right that far apart I see what you mean so your hands are either side of the steering wheel and exactly. that's the distance between your yes. plants okay. now you, you're getting into a, um, a bigger car a sort of one of those four by fours your car your hands will get out to here yes so that's for the bigger herbaceous or bigger plants and now I'm driving a tractor <laughs> which is the width of me and a little bit more yes. and that is how far you would plant things like angelica rosemary and the big lavenders apart i like it okay so go with your steering wheel size. Go, go with your steering wheel because then you'll remember that yes. and another top tip if you want to sow seeds direct now into the soil mm -hmm. slightly early and if you want to know when it's right time to sow you take down your knickers and you sit on the soil. If it's warm enough for your bum, then it's warm <laughs> enough to sow seed. That's, that's going to be an interesting one for my village to, uh, exactly. to see. Yes, yes. So, so obviously it, with an allotment that can cause embarrassment. <laughs> so um, may I suggest you put the back of your hand on the soil? Sounds, yes. If it is cold to the back of your hand. But if I just said that, you wouldn't have remembered it. That's true. Yeah, I'll remember the bottom. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you can t turn it into the back of your hand and the back of your hand will actually tell you that whether it's warm enough because mm -hmm. it has been very, very cold. But you put your hand on there now, the back of your hand, and you'll realise how much it's warmed up. Oh, it's lovely. Isn't that lovely? Yes. I'd want to be, yeah, happily sat in there with my... Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. Without your knickers <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> what do we... What do we typically get wrong? What do people come to you and you sort of silently roll your eyes and think, oh gosh, I get this, asked this question a lot. The most question is, why do I kill basil? <laughs> yes, yeah, I'd happily ask you that one. <laughs> right, well, I will say to you another story for you to remember. Think of the most cantankerous man you know. See, I sh you, you can't see her, her face, she's just giggled, right? <laughs> think of the most cantankerous man you know and never send him to bed wet. Because if you send him to bed wet, he will sulk. Fair enough. Okay. So water in the morning before you go to work, mm -hmm. never at night. Because oh. everybody makes the mistake. They come in from work, they go straight down to the greenhouse or their shed or yes. wherever they go, and they water. Yes. Well, in the UK, we don't have that lovely, warm, constant evening temperature all the time. Yeah, we will drop down to four or five degrees tonight. Absolutely. But we'll be 18 in the day. 
in the tunnels. So my, my thing is, if we will water here before lunch, and we won't water again, because that's when the plant needs water. Yeah, but you're right, we all come home from work though, and we water the garden in the Roll. evening. Roll. First Why? thing in the morning. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you're just, it just sits in water. It, does, it doesn't grow at night. I can see now. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it, you know, yeah. takes you being told, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could ask you all kinds of things about what's wrong in my garden. No problem. I've got a very brown rosemary uh, plant at the moment. Has it gone, did it go brown on one side and then slowly spread through and the whole lot go brown? I couldn't tell you. Is it a crispy brown? Yes. I'm afraid it's dead. It's got rosemary dieback. Oh. There's this fungal infection that's coming in from Europe, which is why the RHS won't let anyone who's exhibiting at Chelsea exhibit rosemary unless it's been in the UK for a set, set amount of time. So I'm afraid don't plant rosemary in that patch again. OK? Can I, can I come here to buy plants? Yes, you can come here when we're open and we're open once a month. Or you can, uh, if you're local, you can always ring or going by on holiday or coming to Bristol for something. Say, I'm coming past on Wednesday, can I pick up? And as long as you know what you want to pick up. But then I run master classes, um, which people then are given free reign of the nursery. Yes, can um, I come and learn from you? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we, ha we run master classes all the time. And uh, I do one on garden design one on how to grow, which is how to propagate, how to sow seed properly. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about Herbfest. Oh, well, Herbfest was last year. It was wonderful. It was anybody and everything that is connected to herbs. Now, when you say that, you suddenly realise that we link the plants, that is, link the herbalists. We have also the chefs. We also have the garden designers. Yes, yeah. And we also have organics and sustainability. And we also have the beekeepers. Yes, yes. So everybody comes and gives talks. And, and, and so there won't be one this year, but there will be one next year. And my oh, garden so. will be finished. Oh, wonderful. And you'll be able to sit in my new garden. Yes, we will, we will definitely visit for that. Yeah. Tell me one last thing that I'm quite fascinated by that I heard you mention on a YouTube video with Charles Dowding, gardener, mm -hmm. extraordinaire. Yep. Um, about young the, Charles. Yeah, absolutely. Young, no, he's younger than me, so young Charles. <laughs> <laughs> um, the link between uh, vitamins and bees and the plants that, that, that kind of produce vitamins and how they are used by bees. Now, this is, this is something which is very new, the research into this. And I'm very excited by it. And um, Bristol University are doing lots of research at the moment that they've been looking into how when a bee pollinates a plant, what the attributes of the plant are after it has been pollinated. Now, some of the plants increase, it increases their vitamins and their minerals, draws it up, so it triggers that. Mm -hmm. But other plants, they're looking at which vitamin it is. And there's some northern tribes that don't get the sun. I can't forget where it is now. And they're researching into what crop that you could grow, that could be pollinated, which will increase the vitamin D. Because Gosh. these people suffer from lack of vitamin D. So they could get it from the plants that they grow rather yes. than the sun that doesn't seem yes. to come out. Yes. That's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. But um, I'm sorry, I'm, I haven't caught, read anything lately on it. And I think I just read about it when I spoke to Charles then. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the great thing about anything to do with gardening. It's not just gardening. Yes, yes. There's much more to it than that. You know, his thing was about um, the decrease in pollinated plants and how they're not germinating as well. Open pollinated plants, germination has got weaker. In the UK specifically, or? UK and Europe. Oh. We, we read too many bad headlines about well, this, <laughs> wildlife, um, ecology. I know, it, and it is very, very, very worrying. But you can then get little corners like here, and you can just see them, those are my sparrows having a fight over something, um, where you have a little haven for, for everything. 
you know, from shrews. And I saw um, a stoat yesterday crossing the road. Oh, that's exciting. So you see, if you're looking, you will see. And the other thing that we've got up the lane here, and I've, it's only happened once to me. I was walking early with my dog. She's not here today. Um, and this barn owl, <gasps> silently, full stretch, sailed over our heads. Oh, what a moment. And it's here. And you don't need a camera. You do need a memory. And that is the other thing about gardening remembering you learn from the seasons and gardening will teach you patience and slow you down and you will then have time to notice what is happening we're all too much in a rush and far too much time looking at our phones So, Paul, I suspect um, Jekka is preaching to the converted somewhat there for you, isn't she? Uh, yeah, although I think my wife would probably still say that I spend too much time on my phone. To be <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, but, but on the other, you know, I'm a, I'm a great advocate for mobile phones in terms of being a a fantastic camera that you can carry around so if you spot yes. something that you don't know what is this you can take a picture and you can upload it to iNaturalist or you know post it on a, an online community somewhere and say what's this and you'll get an answer so there is that going for it but and being quite still relatively new to your new wildlife garden mm. are you le you know I, you haven't even been through a full year all th full seasons yet have you but are you no. are you learning still absolutely yeah yeah i mean there's there's new species up here that we didn't get down south mm -hmm. so that's fab but yeah also what species are associated with which plants for instance so i've taken hundreds of photos over the past few days <laughs> i haven't actually been through them yet but um i did sign up to iNaturalist um so i've I've started uploading records of all of the species that I'm spotting and I'm trying to get all the birds and all the bees. We're learning all the time. And and the succession, the the way that the way that the seasons change and observing things in nature, the way that nature rolls out in spring, you can actually trace it in a line going up the country and you can pick any flowering species and observe it flowering say down there in Tetbury and up here near Carlisle you could probably draw a line moving up the country oh I when see that species is in flower the yes further north you go yes which I think is really cool I mean I, I always try and make a note of when the firsts happen at least so the first sighting of specific species or or families of like noticing um, a bluebell or yeah yeah mm -hmm. so then I can compare it to last year yeah. And the year before and the year before that, depending on how long I managed to keep it up. And then you can learn the patterns and the routines and actually yeah. citizen science as a as a topic is becoming more and more important and actually more popular as well. People like to be a part of it and, and know that what they're looking at and what they're noticing is actually part yeah. of a bigger picture. So we're, we are all learning and I think I need to head off and learn about how to grow rosemary, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, remember, if you want to enter our competition to win two tickets to an open day at Jekka's Farm, together with a signed copy of Jekka's Herb Cookbook, just email your answer to the question, how can you tell whether the soil is warm enough to plant seeds outside? What's Jekka's quite embarrassing test to know if the soil is warm enough? Send your answer on an email to hello at wildlifeworld.co.uk if you're listening to this podcast in the first week of its release. And we'll enter you into the draw to win. And do follow us on social media. We're at Wildlife World LTD, as in limited on Facebook, and at Wildlife World underscore UK on Instagram. You can also read the full blog that accompanies this podcast 
at wildlifeworld.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash podcast. See you next time when we're speaking to Jean Vernon all about surprising pollinators. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.